Okay, so we're now going to try to get fermions from the path integral. Now, it should be clear that we're going to need to do something different, okay? And um, the reason is that what we, what we did in the, the first half of this course was we basically showed that if you do a path integral, which is just some sort of fancy integral over many, many, many numbers, so an integral over ordinary numbers, by which I'm thinking about the integral over the field phi of x with h as a value at every space-time point, that integral gives you a quantum theory with commuting fields in it, because we reproduced everything we knew and loved about the normal scalar field theory, which we know had commuting fields, fields that obeyed canonical commutation relations, canonical, sorry, commutation relations, and not anti-commutation relations. So now we need some new ingredient, we need something new. In other words, we need something so that when we integrate over it, so an integral over something that has yet to be defined, where that something is going to give us anti-commuting fields in the resulting quantum theory. Okay. And uh, the question is, uh, what is this something? Okay. We need to construct some new thing so that when we path integrate over it, we get anti-commuting fields out. So it turns out we're going to need to develop a new kind of number. Okay. And this kind of number is something called a Grassmann number. All right. And um, we will discuss Grassmann numbers now. In fact, in this lecture, we're going to discuss, we're going to pretty much develop the full theory of Grassmann numbers, uh, calculus, all of it. it. It turns out to be easier than normal numbers, and, and we'll see why. But now let's move on and develop the theory of a Grassmann number. Okay. So what is a Grassmann number? A Grassmann number is, it turns out, to be a kind of anti-commuting number. Okay. This should seem reasonable. After all, we are trying to you know, get a theory with anti-commuting operators in the quantum theory. It should seem reasonable we should have a theory of anti-commuting number to do that. Okay. So let's just start defining things and, and see how far we can go. So I'm going to now define a Grassmann number to be the following thing. So a Grassmann number are objects, I can say Grassmann numbers, are objects, let me call them theta and eta, that anti-commute. In other words, you know, normal numbers, if you switch their order around, nothing happens. Grassmann numbers I'm going to define in the following way. Theta times eta equals to minus eta times theta. Okay. That's it. That is their defining property. And now we're going to start with this axiom and see how far we can go. We're just going to keep pushing on it and develop the full math of Grassmann numbers and how to manipulate them. Okay. So, um, and I'm going to stress they're just these are just numbers, okay? They're they're not operators in a Hilbert space. They're just numbers. That's how you should think about them at this point. Right. Okay. So what does this mean? Um, this means the square of any Grassmann number is zero. Because theta square, in other words, theta theta equals to minus theta theta equals to zero. Okay. Um, this fact will turn out to make algebra uh, sort of refreshingly easy compared to normal numbers. Okay, Grassmann numbers are algebraically far simpler than normal ones. Now, um, we can multiply a Grassmann number by a normal number. In the normal way. Okay. Now, 
Now, um, it turns out that the product of two Grassmann numbers Theta, eta, this thing by itself commutes with an, another Grassmann number. Uh, say eta prime. Um, because if you take the eta prime and push it through theta and eta, you get one minus sign from the eta, one from the theta. And so you can think about the product of two Grassmann numbers, theta, eta, as a normal number because it commutes. Okay, so um, now uh, let's consider a function of a single Grassmann number. So think about a function f of theta of a single Grassmann theta. We can Taylor expand f of theta in powers of theta. So let's do it. So f of theta, if I Taylor expand in powers of theta is, well, there's a constant term a, uh, there's a linear term in the expansion, b theta, and, uh, and that's it, okay? Because theta squared is zero. So, um, you know, uh, this is nice, okay? So this is the full function. So here's the first hint that, that the, you know, the calculus of Grassmann numbers is very different from normal numbers. The full function, the most general function f of theta is described by two bits of data, A and B. That's it. Okay. So okay, this is a Taylor expansion. This is this is very nice. All right. Let me stress the theta squared equals to zero. Okay. So um, now uh, a brief aside. In, in writing this formula down, I have not actually told you um, whether A and B are normal numbers or Grassmann numbers. Uh, this actually depends what you're interested in. Um, we are often interested we care about when f is normal, so f is a commuting number, so f is a commuting function, um, and theta is anti-commuting, that you can see implies that a is commuting and b is Grassmann. And you can see that right from there. And um, this depends what you're interested in. Most of what I'm gonna say works no matter what a and b are. But every once in a while, something only works in one case, then I'll try to tell you about that and be very explicit. Okay. okay this is an aside. Okay. So um, next, let's do calculus. Okay. So what is calculus? Uh, calculus is uh, derivatives and integrals. Let's do derivatives first. So how do I take a derivative with a Grassmann number? So there's a little bit of ambiguity here whether we define the derivative to act from the left or from the right. Uh, from the right, let me define it in the following way. So what is the derivative from the right of this function f of theta? Well, you know, look at it. It, it seems like you should probably pick off the linear piece, right? That seems like a good definition for a derivative. So indeed, f of theta, the derivative of f of theta from the, the right is defined to be Now, um, from the left, what do we have then? So from the left, we then have d theta f of theta equals to minus b, okay? Where here I actually assume that b was grasping like above. In other words, you have to anti-commute um, b and theta to get this minus sign. Okay, um, that's it. We're done with derivatives. That, that's all, that's the most complicated derivative you have to take because this is the most complicated function you can have. Okay, good. Okay, next up, integrals. This is important because our, our whole goal is going to be to stick a Grassmann number into a path integral. So you have to know how to do integrals. Okay, so um, we really care about the, the infinite, the analog of minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so the integral over the full range, that's a reasonable thing to do for normal numbers. For Grassmann numbers, we don't really even know what range means, but let's try to figure out the analog of, of this, um, this definite integral over the whole range. Okay. So the sort of question I'm asking is, what is 
the integral d theta f of theta. In other words, what is the integral d theta of a plus b times theta? OK, so um, how do we figure this out? So first of all, the integral should be linear in f. Okay. Which means it should be linear in a and b. OK, and um, we can actually figure out what, what precise linear combination of a and b we want by appealing to another property. In all of our derivations of Ward identities, you know, Gaussian integrals, blah, 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 we often uh, shifted the integration variable. So it would be nice if we could define Grassmann integration to be invariant under shifting the integration variable. So in other words, what we want is the following thing to be true. If I have the integral d theta f of theta, I want this to be the same as the integral d theta f of theta plus eta. Okay, this is the demand that I'd like to make. So what is this? This is integral d theta a plus b eta plus b theta. And now, if I want this to be invariant under the, under the shift, notice that the, um, the shift changes the value of the constant term, the term that's not multiplying theta, but it, it leaves the, the term multiplying theta invariant. Okay. So the only possible integral that is invariant under the shift is the coefficient of the linear term. And um, we could, of course, multiply that by some factor, Let's just take that factor to be one for convenience. So in other words, we will then define the integral d theta a plus b theta to be b, okay? This is the integral of this Grassmann function, which is again, I remind you, the most general function of one variable. Okay, so uh, that's, that's it. We're done with integration pretty much. Um, a few uh, little uh, little things here. So basically, uh, here I, I assumed actually that b was commuting, which is a bit sleazy to do, because I didn't worry about whether it was theta b or b theta. So um, we need a, another rule. If we want to, to integrate over two multiple, uh, over two Grassmann numbers, so if you want to integrate over say, um, theta one and theta two, then there's a sign ambiguity. You have to tell me which integral to do first. So we're going to use the following convention. I'm going to use this convention. Integral d theta, integral d eta, eta theta equals to plus one, not minus one. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm integrating over variables eta and theta here. And um, in other words, what I'm saying here is do the inner integral first. Okay, this is a sign convention that we need if we have multiple, if we're doing an integral over multiple Grassmann variables. Okay, so um, that's it, we're done with integrals. Now, um, let me say a few more things, of course. Uh, what else do we need? Okay, well, if you remember the Dirac field is, is complex, so we're gonna need um, complex Grassmann numbers. Let's define those next. So um, we, we already have access to i, the imaginary unit, the thing that squares to minus one. So we can define complex Grassmann numbers the same way as we defined uh, complex ordinary numbers. We're gonna define them, complex Grassmann numbers, in terms of their real and imaginary parts.
In particular, I'm going to have theta, a complex Grassmann number, which I'll call theta 1 plus i theta 2. And I'm going to have its conjugate, theta conjugate, which I'm going to call 1 over root 2 theta 1 minus i theta 2. Okay, this is the ordinary definition of, of uh, complex numbers. So we are also going to define complex conjugation to reverse the order of products. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if I have theta eta conjugate, this is defined to be eta conjugate theta conjugate, okay? It's equal to, of course, minus theta conjugate, theta conjugate. Um, this should look uh, pleasant and soothing to you. This is the same as for uh, the Hermitian conjugation of operators in, um, in, uh, in quantum mechanics. We're doing that here for, for normal complex conjugation of numbers as well. This should seem reasonable. Okay, so now let's do a complex integral over Grassmann numbers. So we may now verify the following. Let me verify for you that the integral of d theta, d theta conjugate, theta conjugate theta equals two. So here we go. So first let me expand theta and theta conjugate out in terms of real and imaginary parts. So I have d theta one plus i d theta two, d theta one minus i, d theta two, theta one minus i, theta two, theta one plus i, theta two, factor of two. And now uh, you can work out what all these factors do, and you can make a few things here and there, and what you find is that this whole thing is equal to d theta one, d theta two, theta two, theta one, and finally, I use my rule for integrating multiple Grassmann numbers to get that this is equal to 1. All right. So in other words, uh, what this means is that I can treat theta and theta conjugate as independent variables, just like we do for normal complex numbers. Okay. That's really the point of this uh, little exercise. All right. So now um, we've done integration, we have complex numbers. Let's now learn how to do a Gaussian Grassmann integral. This is of course really important as well because what is the quantum field theory path integral but integrals over many, many, many Gaussians. So let's do an integral over a Gaussian of Grassmann variables. Okay, so what I'm gonna do so this is the kind of integral that appears in quantum field theory, integral d theta conjugate d theta e to the minus theta conjugate d theta. So this is the analog of a Gaussian for Grassmann numbers, right? It's e to the minus something squared. Okay. Where here something squared has to be something conjugate times something. All right, so what is this? Well, again, I can Taylor expand the function and uh, again, only the first term in the Taylor expansion is there because of the glory of Grassmannness. This is equal to d theta conjugate d theta. So let me anti commute the theta. Uh, sorry, let me anti commute the theta and the theta conjugate. So by the way, I should have uh, made clear here that b here is a normal number. Here b is a commuting ordinary number like two or four or something like that, okay? But theta and theta conjugate are Grassmann numbers. Okay, and uh, now this is in the right form for me to do the integral. I do the integral over the theta first then the theta conjugate and I just find that the answer is b, okay? So the integral over a Gaussian uh, Grassmann, over a Grassmann um, uh, function over, sorry, a Gaussian of Grassmann variables is just B, where B is the thing appearing in the exponent. Okay. Let me point out that if theta had been an ordinary number, been a commuting number, this integral would have been a bit different. 
In that case, the integral would have been integral d theta conjugate d theta. You've done this integral already a couple of times. So if it had been a normal commuting number, we would have found um, not b, but 2 pi over b. This is a normal exercise, usual integral. Now, the 2 pi doesn't really matter too much. The 2 pi is just a normalization. However, it's very important that b here is in the denominator. Okay, So b in the Grassmann case is in the numerator. But b in the ordinary case is in the denominator. This difference turns out to be extremely important. Okay? It has some physical significance in the path integrals that we're going to do. Okay. So we are making steady progress in our study of Grassmann numbers. Next, we have just done an integral over a single uh, complex, over a single pair of a variable and its conjugate. I now want to integrate over many Grassmann numbers. So let me introduce uh, n Grassmann variables. i, okay, where here i runs from 1 to n. So um, to do this, um, I want to understand how changes of variables are going to work in integration. So let's consider a unitary matrix, a unitary u, uh, ij, such that theta i prime equals to u i j theta j, uh, where again the repeated index means that I'm summing over all j. So I'm really taking my vector of Grassmann's and acting on it with a unitary matrix u. Now I want to understand the product over all of these Grassmann's. So consider the product i goes from 1 to n of theta i prime. Okay. So first, let me take this and write it as 1 over n factorial. Then we'll introduce a few things. i1, oops, i2, blah, 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 all the way up to i n. Okay, so what have I done here? Rather than working out the product, here it was just a product over all of the Grassmann's. Here, I'm summing over all the different ways to order the Grassmann's. And then I am, uh, all these different orderings are of course equivalent up to a possible change of minus sign. This epsilon keeps track of all the minus signs that are there in this reordering. And then there are n factorial different ways to order them. This one over the n factorial takes care of that as well. Okay, So this is just a slightly more symmetric way to write the original product. Now, let me use this fact here to write each of these theta i primes in terms of theta i's. So what do we get? We get here u i1 j1, theta j1, u i2 j2, theta j2, and so on and so forth, all the way up to u i n j n, theta j n. Okay, so far so good. So next, it turns out that I can take this and I can write all of these thetas, so the product of the theta j's, that appears here, I can write all of those, again, taking out a factor of the epsilon. So let me write down what I mean, and then we can discuss it. So I n u i1 j1, u i2 j2, blah, 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 all the way up to u i n j n times epsilon j1 j2 all the way up to j n times the product of j from 1 to n, k 
data jet. So what have I done here? Well, I have this product of theta j's. It's clear that product is zero if ever the j's agree, if ever j1 equals to j2, and therefore the whole product is proportional to this epsilon symbol, and the coefficient of proportionality is, of course, just the product of all the thetas. Now, what is this thing here, this particular combination of epsilon symbols contracted with u's? If you think for a moment about your linear algebra, you'll realize that this is just the determinant of u times the product of j1 to the j. Okay. So in other words, the product of all of the thetas, if I transform theta by this unitary matrix, that product transforms as an overall factor of the determinant, in fact. Okay, so we've just shown. Now, let's understand what this means for integration. So there's an implication for what happens if you change variables in integration. So consider a, a general integral, which is, um, say, the integral of dn theta prime, okay, times some function of all of these thetas, f of theta i. Let's imagine doing this integral, okay. Now here again, theta prime is related to theta by this uh, unitary transformation u. Now the only term that survives this integral. is the term in f, which is the product of all of the thetas. Okay, so f in general will have many terms in it, but the only term that survives is the term that is a product of all of the thetas. Okay, anything else will be killed by the integral. Now, we can write this product of all the thetas in terms of the product of all the theta primes using this formula that we just derived with a factor of determinant of u in the denominator. And now we can just do the integral. Okay. However, this factor of determinant of u survives. So in other words, what I've just convinced you is, or just told you is, that the integral d theta prime of f of theta equals to the integral over d n theta with a factor of determinant of u in the denominator. Okay. So again, this is over all of the variables. So one way to interpret this is that the measure for Grassman integration transforms in the opposite way that we are used to, okay? It's the opposite way than for normal integration. Okay, this is the opposite. Uh, for normal integration, this factor of the determinant of u would have been in the numerator and not in the denominator. So note, by the way, that this implies that if u is unitary, then an integral of the following form, so d n theta d n theta conjugate of f of theta and theta prime, comes with a factor of determinant of u determinant of u conjugate the dm theta uh, prime conjugate prime f of theta and theta conjugate and then these two things will cancel because the determinant because of u being unitary and so we find conjugate. So in other words, if you're integrating over both the variable and its complex conjugate, 
the, um, the integral is invariant under a unitary change of variables. And um, that should be reassuring. Okay, that's, that's a nice thing. Okay. So finally, having developed all this technology, we're finally ready to do our um, uh, to do our uh, our final integral that we'll need. We've still been building up to doing a path integral. Let's do the this the almost final step. Let's consider a Hermitian matrix. B i j and do the integral integral d m theta I'm oh, sorry d m theta d m theta conjugate of the exponential of minus theta i d i j where theta i is conjugated. Okay, so B is of course an n by n Hermitian matrix. This is very close to the Gaussian matrices that we will, the Gaussian integrals will do in path integration. Because it's Hermitian, we can diagonalize it with a unitary transformation. Uh, let me call its eigenvalues little b i. We then find that the integral d n theta, d n theta conjugate times the exponential of minus theta i conjugate d i j theta j, in other words, the integral we started with. equals to, so now we move to the diagonal variables, which are theta prime, and in the prime variables, the matrix B i j is, is diagonal, so we have sum over i theta i prime conjugate B i theta i prime, and this is now a product of, um, of ordinary Gaussian Grassmann integrals. So this ends up being the product of i bi. Okay. And this then is equal to the determinant of the Hermitian matrix B because it's the product of all of the eigenvalues. Okay. So again, in normal integration, This determinant would have been in the denominator. In Grassmann integration, it's in the numerator. Okay. okay, so we finally have almost everything that we need. The final thing we require is a Gaussian integral in the presence of a linear term. So like a source, so for example, you want something like this, i of eta, eta dagger, which is the integral of d n theta, d n theta conjugate, times the exponential of minus theta dagger d theta, plus eta dagger theta, plus theta dagger eta, um, where I'm moving to a matrix notation, hopefully it's pretty obvious how the matrix notation works, and where eta and eta dagger are some external variables. So there are some external vectors of Grassmann numbers. So now we know how to do this. We've done many integrals like this already. To do this, we shift theta 
to theta minus b inverse eta and shift theta dagger to theta dagger minus eta dagger the inverse and this shift leaves the integral invariant because we carefully built our Grassmann integration the shifting variables of integration is okay doesn't change the integral and then plugging this back in here and going through some very simple steps we can conclude that i of eta eta dagger is equal to the determinant of b times the exponential of plus eta dagger the inverse eta. So we can think of this maybe as the um, the fundamental theorem of Q of T with fermions. This is the basic building block that we use to find the Feynman rules for fermions from the path integral. Notice that it is really exactly the same as for commuting numbers. In other words, you could imagine writing down the same integral where theta and eta were ordinary numbers. It's exactly the same except for the crucial fact that the determinant is in the numerator and not in the denominator. Okay? That's really the only difference that we have. Okay, so that concludes our whirlwind tour of the algebra of finite numbers of Grassmann variables and how to do integrals with them. In the next video, we are going to um, understand how all this translates into the path integral and derive the Feynman rules for fermions from there.